All right. Um, well, welcome everyone. Sorry for the late start. We're having a few, you know, as usual, <laughs> last minute technical issues. Um, but we're so glad to be here today with you for the first of two part panel on the George Walker cello sonata. My name is Francesca McNeely. I'm a Boston based freelance cellist, which really just means I'm involved with a lot of different ensembles and organizations from Castle of Our Skins to Cello Bello. But I'm unbelievably honored to be joined today by several of my dearest friends and mentors for this discussion. We have Astrid Schween of the Juilliard Quartet and the Juilliard School, Owen Young of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, Seth Parker Woods at the University of Chicago and the Coffin Music Center, and in spirit, and hopefully eventually, we have Emmanuel Feldman of Tufts University and the New England Conservatory. So now this piece we're discussing today is obviously a piece for two instruments. So the incredible Joy Klein Finney of the Sarasota and Easton Festivals will be joining us next weekend for panel number two to bring in the much needed pianist perspective in this conversation. And coincidentally, she's actually a colleague of just about everybody here. So I know we're really excited to have her. Um, huge thank you to Wilsa for all of your technical help today. And a thank you to Delos Music for granting us permission to use the recording clips for these panels. Um, now, before we dive into the piece specifically, I just wanted to give a brief introduction on the composer for those of you less familiar with his name. So George Walker was born in Washington, DC in 1922 and died only a few years ago in 2018. He was one of the preeminent American composers of the 20th century, in addition to being an accomplished pianist and organist. After studying at the Oberlin Conservatory, he pursued an artist diploma at the Curtis Institute of Music, where he studied with the likes of Rudolf Serkin and Rosario Scalero. He became the first black musician to solo with the Philadelphia Orchestra and to receive a doctorate from the Eastman School of Music. He also became the first African-American to win a Pulitzer Prize for Music for his orchestral work, Lilacs. So my first question to all of you on the panel is what, what is your origin story with this cello sonata? Because I remember from earlier discussions that um, everybody seemed to have come to it at a different phase in their life, whether as a student or more recently in some cases. Um, and I also remember everyone seemed to have some story about the composer himself. So I would just love to, if you could frame this for our audience um, to tell us about what was your first experience with this piece. And uh, why don't we start with, uh, um, hey, Owen, <laughs> let's start with you. Okay, you hear me? Oh, I, I was hoping you wouldn't start with me, but that's okay. Um, so, you know, it's hard for me to remember exactly when the first time I uh, heard of George Walker. Um, it, it's a little bit faint now, but I know that I uh, knew of the composer before I knew of his music. Uh, uh, he, along with a handful of other composers, came into my knowledge, knowing. Um, but it really wasn't until, you know, I have to, uh, I have to cue Miss Joy Klein Finney um, when I, because I studied and worked on and played the piece with her. So I can't remember if it was her saying, hey, let's play the George Walker Sonata, or I don't remember, I should know that. I will know that by next week. But um, what became apparent was um, that, that first of all, this was a, this was, so when I, when I learned about George Walker, the fact that he was the first uh, black musician to play with the Philadelphia Orchestra, the solo piano, you know his his education, his his teachers. I you know I I was frankly I was like wow this is amazing and I I probably should I wish I knew uh, of this uh, this this wonderful composer when I was like ten years old. You know oh there's a manual manuals there. Oh, hey, hey. Yeah. Hey, I had terrible internet problems and then I kept trying to sign in it wasn't working but hello. No, no worries. problem. Happy to see you. We were worried about you. Anyway, <laughs> um, and so I wish I had known about him as a child and not as an adult. That's just a general thing. Why not? Because his um, his artistry and his everything that he had uh, created and his whole person is is of of, uh, of need of knowing. Um, but uh, I do remember when I got the music and started looking at it, um, and I had played other sonatas of, of, of that period, you know, the Barber Sonata, and, and I thought, gosh, this is, and I think, and the other thing is, I don't think I heard it first. Sometimes you can hear a recording. I think I learned it from 
not hearing it prior. So it was a real surprise and a real, I remember a really sense of discovery. I'd heard of the Sonata, that indeed it was a really great Sonata, but I had not uh, had a chance to hear it prior, which is a lot of, which is how a lot of us come to know music. We hear it and we want to learn it or whatever. And uh, with joy, um, uh, we learned it and played it and, and, and several sonata, uh, several recitals and had the incredible honor and pleasure of playing it for George Walker. Uh, and that was a, a incredible experience. It's an incredible experience when you get to play for the composer, period, because now you have um, that added uh, uh, um, experience. I mean, this is the creator and he can, it, it's a great, it's a, it doesn't always happen, obviously. We all haven't had the uh, pleasure of, uh, of uh, playing a sonata for Beethoven, right? So we have no idea, but you know what I mean? And, 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 and just the whole experience and every time I, I perform it, I, uh, I see something new. It's lovely. It's an incredible piece. It's just, and it's, and it's, it's so wonderful in its brevity. It covers a lot in its brevity. I, I, maybe Seth will talk more about it and, and how it's constructed. And uh, I have more stories, but I'm going to stop talking so other people can tell. <laughs> Go ahead. That's great. Um, I don't know who wants to jump in next, but feel free. <laughs> Manuel, maybe? Oh no, Astrid. Yes, Astrid seems ready. <laughs> e e either way, I um, I'll I'll jump in very briefly and just say that um, it's so great to be with all of you and to talk about this extremely accomplished man, um, George Walker. He was um, a remarkable pianist as well. Um, he studied with Rudolf Serkin. He was in the Curtis Institute. Uh, he studied at Oberlin. He gave his town hall debut. Um, played with the Philadelphia Orchestra with a Rachmaninoff third concerto. I mean, this guy had chops in all departments. And, um, you know, the fact that he's still relatively unknown is just something that, you know, I guess that's why one of the reasons we're all here is to, to really celebrate his genius um, and this wonderful piece that he left us. Um, I first got to know the piece and Dr. Walker when I was 18, um, I went, I was invited to play a recital at the Harlem School of the Arts, and I was asked to find a piece by a black composer that would be a nice sort of fitting tribute to Dr. Martin Luther King. And so I needed something slow and somber, and I went to the American Music Center, and there was the George Walker Sonata. And I just kind of shrieked, like, what's this? Why don't I know about this? And um, I, at the time, I was playing with a wonderful pianist named Mark Salman, and I said, Mark, we got to read this thing. And we sort of figured it out. We called Dr. Walker. We went to Montclair, New Jersey, had tea and crumpets with him, and spent a whole day figuring out the sonata. And I just want to put in a little plug um, and make my friend Joy Klein blush a little because it was, um, I think it was when she and I were students of Sam Sanders at Juilliard that I introduced her to the George Walker sonata. And I can see how wonderfully this initial pollination has paid off that we're all <laughs> we're all kind of connected through joy anyway i'll be quiet for a while and and somebody pick up the ball please <laughs> so uh maybe i should say a few words about that uh, first of all i want to say that joy klein finney has been the lightning rod for me on uh, discovering george's uh cello sonata um and it, it's been an amazing journey with her. Um, I can also say that uh, uh, that same lightning rod got uh, Owen, and Owen was before me. So uh, Joy and I were playing the Barber Cello Sonata, and she said, well, you've got to check out the, uh, the Walker. And I think the first time I heard it was with a recording that Joy had from Owen playing from, uh, live on WGBH, and a wonderful uh, a wonderful performance. So I got to hear that. Um, and um, just to say, uh, things evolved from there. We just started playing a program everywhere um, of American music. And, and uh, I was trying to put a lot of elements together. So we added uh, um, the Barber Sonata, the Walker Sonata, and then we, I did some uh, Gershwin arrangements along with it. Um, and so I uh, set up a program with Joy in New York City 
uh, and um, I was lucky enough to borrow a Stradivarius cello to play that program. It was sort of like a, a publicity thing. We were trying to get some interest in, in, uh, in this uh, piece, and we invited Dr. Walker, and so I met him. Uh, there for the first time, so I performed his piece, and then there he was, and uh, <laughs> uh, very, very exciting, um, uh, very exciting time. I'm also going to echo what uh, Astrid said. Uh, this guy was a genius. I mean, he, I think he was like uh, 18 when he already graduated from Oberlin, um, and then there are a lot of Curtis Institute connections. I'm an alum. And um, uh, George studied with uh, Rosario Scal uh, Scalero mm -hmm. at, um, at uh, uh, Curtis, who uh, also taught Barber. So there was a, a bunch of connections all going on there. So, and um, it, it was just a great honor to, to, to meet him. Uh, he was very, very beautiful person. The best way I can describe him, very... <laughs> very stately, and, or at least maybe that's what I know because I got to know him in a later part of his life. Uh, but anyway, so that's uh, just saying just a little bit, maybe I should yeah. let someone else talk. No, and I guess, I mean, Seth, you might have gotten to know him most recently of, of everybody here. Uh, yeah, hello everyone. Um, I first met um, Dr. Walker in 2008, and that came via, um, Ursula Oppens, who's like a great mentor and colleague and now friend of mine. Um, at the time we were working on a larger, um, like chamber ensemble piece of it's called Modus, which is it's quite expansive as far as instrumentation. It includes like two grand pianos, two guitars, like a string trio and some winds. And then, I mean, the parts were all extremely, extremely virtuosic. It felt like it was an entire concerto, like micro concerto for every instrument, it, it essentially. And then out of that, um, Eventually, um, Ursula was like, well, you should maybe like go and meet him. You know, he's written a lot for the cello. So eventually I went out to meet him and there was a stack of scores that was given to me. And on the top was, of course, the cello sonata, um, including his concerto and his, his movements for cello and orchestra. Um, it, it, actually, the concerto is actually a New York Philharmonic uh, commission. Um, and so eventually I started working on this piece with Ursula and then eventually working with a student on it and getting the chance to play it for him. Um, but in the last few years, um, I helped start a, a big symphony in the UK called Chineke and we performed his lyric for strings out there. Um, so in this time, it kind of helped rekindle kind of a connection with him and started to kind of re reignite uh, my love for this sonata. And so I've been playing it a lot in the last few years now, but yeah, that was kind of the beginnings, yeah. Oh, thank you all. Um, you know, part of what we're trying to achieve today is to obviously um, give people an opening into the piece, especially for those who've never, you know, either heard it or aren't familiar with it. And so um, I was just curious if whether you guys can offer any um, any insight in terms of like the overall maybe um, tonal aesthetic of the composer, because I'm more familiar with the string quartet works. I've had the chance to play um, I guess the string quartet were the lyric for strings. I mean, you, you mentioned Seth. And I know that when we learned that piece, we were all immediately aware of the sort of um, French kind of, that 20th century French sort of sound. There's a lot of Debussy, feelings of Debussy in the quartet and that sort of thing. And I don't know if there's anything you can offer um, on the cello sonata that might give somebody, I don't know, just something familiar to grab onto as they're diving in for the first time. This is really to anybody. A quick sort of overview, maybe, that um, Dr. Walker himself talked about wanting to use this piece to incorporate some basic elements of jazz with real classical structure. So the, the first movement he described as a sonata form, um, the second movement as an ABA with a B section that has a, a canon, um, which is just gorgeous, um, and then the third movement is a rondo, which you know, he was, he sort of said with a little smile, has a boogie woogie bass. And I remember <laughs> just seeing this very distinguished man in all of his different guises. And I just thought, wow, this is fantastic. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I hear and, you know, just just from a sort of, um, what's the word, an intuitive response to the piece is the textures are marvelously varied. And, you know, if you're a, a Carter fan, I think the rhythm, the rhythmic language will speak to you. Um, the harmonic language of, of Barber, from that similar sort of source that they both shared, is in there. And, and Walker had a great lyrical gift. He really created some of the most wonderfully sweeping um, melodic arcs. So it's, um, 
you know, that's just kind of a, a little a little lay perspective in a way. But yeah. Mm. No, that's wonderful. And if any, anyone else wanted to add in there? Uh, sure. I, I would say that uh, it's great that he defies category. Um, it's just, to me, um, what he's got in there is something that I think is um, both academically, uh, when you look at the way it's put together, is architectural and, and has great structure to it, but it always appeals to audiences. You, he finds a way to um, have such a, a long arching line, you know, like in the very beginning of the piece, even though it's, it's very, uh, uh, you know, sort of jagged and motivic. Uh, there's, there's a way that he draws people in with his music. It's very personable and very uh, heartfelt. I think he's a very genuine uh, composer that way. Uh, his source is very deep um, somehow. And uh, with all of that intelligence, he doesn't lose that soul or his, his directness about communication. Um, and I, I think that's what I love about it. And I think that's what people do, do feel when they listen to his music. There's a really direct and deep contact that you can feel. And, and I will just add exactly what Emmanuel and Astrid said. For me, incredibly lyric and melodic with that scaffolding that's steeped in, in, in strong structure and how he takes the motives and builds on them and all done uh, masterfully. Um, I wanna say uh, there's a, like a brevity about it that's also really wonderful. It's not a big, big, large piece. It's actually a, 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 a time-wise very small, I mean, a short piece, but it feels longer because of his ability to make all these things work. Very difficult to do. It, it, and that's one of the things that drew me to this piece. Um, but uh, his, his ability to do that, and again, incredible, incredibly melodic, at, at times uh, far reaching and at times very motivic and everything works to make it, make a, an incredibly beautiful building. It's great. Well, it feels like this might be a good opportunity to start to dive in a little bit. <laughs> um, for anybody watching, um, our plan for, for these panels was to start with a discussion of the first movement, getting into the second movement of the Sonata, finishing up next week, and then hopefully uh, you know, branching out to more questions um, that may come in. But um, we're going to get a little nerdy about this, so I hope you guys are ready. <laughs> Seth, if you want to get started, please take it away. Okay, sorry, <laughs> navigating all the things. So I think it would be great. I mean, I, I hope everyone that's watching or tuning in now has had a chance to listen to the Walker. Um, so not at least the first two movements, at least it's, since that's what we're gonna be kind of focusing on today. And everyone has like, a, we've kind of all talked a little bit ahead, ahead of time to kind of get an, a kind of an overview of things we would love to kind of bring out. But I, of course, I think it's really great to start from the very beginning. You gotta definitely like, taught this piece now and definitely listen to other cellos like how does one count this from the very beginnings I think even just in the piano part it's basically a, a doubling of, of triplets essentially but they can start to sound like duples so uh, I think it can be a little scary where the cellist enters in the second bar um, so let's just have a, a little bit of a listen to the beginning um, you can kind of follow on along here I think I brought up um, this score here, you can kind of get an idea of just a little bit of this excerpt. Maybe I can zoom this in a little bit. Um, okay. And of course, this is Emmanuel Feldman and Joy Klein Finney. <laughs> Thank you. 
So maybe, maybe all, can we talk a little bit about just this opening? It, it's from the outset, it, this opening, it always feels so rhapsodic um, and like a little bit of like a wild horse straight out of the gate. <laughs> Uh, but it's it's also very grounding, I guess, in a way, but this, the, the use of pitches and how he brings this same melody back, theme one, we can think of it in that way, back multiple times or different kind of um, segmented um, versions of it over time. Um, maybe any of you would like to speak to that? I just want to say that's marvelous playing. Emmanuel, it's so nice to hear your recording and, and you enjoy it together. It's really lovely. Um, I was smiling at the very beginning because I, I remember sitting there in numerous rehearsals kind of missing my entrance and, and just sort of laughing at how effectively, um, it's like the, the world's most powerful hemiola, right? Yeah. Because you, you hear the, um, the piano triplets are organized so that every other note is a low note, right? So ba da di da 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 Yeah. Yeah, you start hearing all kinds of other things. And I remember I just had like certain key pitches I had to lock in on uh, in order to kind of track my way. Um, but that that's so great. And that becomes that that triplet motive is also reflective in the cello line. Um, and he makes such beautiful use of both the, the motive and the melody. They're very intricately linked and we'll, we'll see how that works later. Yeah, it's quite interesting if you're just looking at it from uh, purely just, I guess, form, I guess, of a just propulsion. You have like a one, two, one, two, one, and then he goes into three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one. So it, this whole idea of like thinking about just kind of phrase structure in that way also when you get past just the, the main notes um, and trying to put it all together in a way was quite interesting. And then the cello taking it essentially in the for those of you looking this this last line here where the cello officially takes over that triplet section. I remember just in my rehearsals with my duo partner, um, trying to still keep them even where they don't start to sound like duples of, <laughs> um, because the ear can play my, mind games on you essentially, especially in different types of concert halls, which is definitely something we've discovered from um, place to place and how things that went so well in every other concert uh, space. Now, all of a sudden I'm hearing duples for the first time ever and I'm like, Andrew, did you change something? <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, what are you doing there? That's not, that's, what are you, what are you, are you experimenting? Um, so uh, definitely very interesting <laughs> to have these, these, um, these experiences. Um, but yeah. Um, I should say the same thing. I'm not, I wasn't immune from that. I also remember some rehearsals saying, oh gosh, I can't, oh, wait, I, let's try that again. Uh, I didn't get that. <laughs> and it, it is because he's, uh, uh, very cleverly uh, puts puts basically the the two instruments in different in different uh, time signatures in a way almost um, so uh, that is the tendency is to hear as uh, Astrid was saying hear the the low note the low a in this figure um, in the in the piano part uh, instead of hearing a triplet you hear you hear fours. Um, so I had sort of a thing and Seth, you were saying like you get into a different acoustic and then you're like, oh my God, now what? Um, so what I did is I found a, fo a foolproof way of doing this, or at least it worked for me. If I got into an acoustic and I started hearing the fours, I was like, okay, so I'll just hear fours. And what you do is you just count in three and you go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. And then, and then you're back into, you're, you're just basically going back into four just in case that happened. So I had that, that way, I was just like, I just don't want ever that, you know, to get into a concert situation. And, uh, and Seth, you're right, if you get in a really echoey place, it changes it. And I remember talking with Dr. Walker about it, and, and he said, well, what's very important in the beginning is the piano has to be extremely smooth and even. No accentuations, don't help the cellist. Um, so, <laughs> so I knew right away it wasn't going to get any help. Um, uh, with that and, you know, just being in different modes, uh, but such great writing, such great but, writing. We have to come up to it. <laughs> now, spoken like a true pianist, he says, don't help the cellist. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> so, and, oh, sorry, go ahead, Owen. Can I just add two cents? So I have to commiserate with Astrid, everybody. I remember, and uh, bless uh, Joy for being patient with me at this beginning, because I was like, what? 
well, you know, we, I, I do remember this, that it took some doing to, to just coordinate this beginning because of these uncertainties that we, that we've all talked about. But, and the, the other thing that's, that is, is impar that is very important is that you got to know when the piano has begun, <laughs> right? <laughs> you do not know that where one is, not that you have to accident like that, but then you then you don't know, then that's, you're done. So I remember thinking once, if I know where it really begins, then I could jump on. But I, I think it's also extraordinary how, I think that uh, Dr. Walker, like he, he made this, uh, um, he, cr he created this uh, sense of um, very strict rhythmic uh, integrity in both parts, but yet, is, there's an immediate feeling when the when the cello enters of, of of a certain kind of freedom, you know, and that's why I think that that as Emmanuel said that both parts are sort of in different rhythmic uh, schemes, and the cello of course takes off. He kind of it kind of launches off into this beautiful melody that up high, high playing on the A string, and already in bar seven and eight, you you've hit a you've hit this incredible height, and it's just a really really clever um beautiful uh way of of how of how this uh piece launches and i've always uh, marveled at that anyway i'm done yeah I, I just want to add something about I'm, I'm noticing in your performance manual and i was also listening to a recording um that dr walker did with the italo babini <laughs> yeah and um so it's interesting to listen into to boeing's um, when I played this for him, and again, I played it a few years ago for him, uh, the year before he died, or two years before, at a concert um, for Juilliard. He was there, and I asked him, what's that? That's great. Yeah, it was nice to see him again, um, and he was just as lively and energetic as ever. Um, and I said, what do you think about the Boeings? And he said, well, a lot of people have taken my legato meaning in, in different ways. So I actually slur a lot of this stuff, um, including the double stops in the second theme. And um, I was noticing in the recordings, there are different, different interpretations of how to do that, which is fantastic. Um, it's, it's just neat because we're all, we're all sort of striving for the line, but also the clarity, the rhythmic clarity. No, it's fascinating. I mean, I just want to jump in because I see there are a few comments that some people are leaving. Um, and a friend from the Sphinx community, Ismar Gomez, says that um, I guess he had a chance to speak to George Walker about the Sonata opening. He said Walker himself played a duple feeling at the opening in his own recording, but told me it should absolutely sound like triplets. Don't follow his example. <laughs> a little advice from Ismar. It's very true. Very true. Very, it's very incredible true. how accessible he seemed to make himself to cellists that were, at least, I mean, I'm, I'm impressed um, hearing how everyone seems to have a story. There's somebody else here who I think taught at Smith College um, when George Walker was there, and, and it sounds like they played chamber music together, and it's just incredible. Wow. Thank you to everyone who's, who's engaging with this right now and on um, the various social media channels. Please keep leaving the stories. This is wonderful. <laughs> Maybe we can jump to maybe another excerpt going on to this are the you know the infamous um, double stops here the little chords. <laughs> um, mind you, if, for those of you who haven't heard it, this this next speaker coming up here with also with this what we call essentially the second theme, kind of in contrast to, to the first, but also in the piano part, which is actually quite beautiful. Um, almost it's not necessarily stagnant, but there feels like there's moments of stasis, it, he, very much the pianist really gets out of the way and it really becomes uh, mostly the, the cellist moment here, but still adding in these very beautiful entrances. Um, Seth, Seth if, if you play this excerpt, can you go into the piano part, the piano version of it as well? Yeah. The, oh, with like the, oh no, I don't have that, I don't have that. The, the digitized version of that, yet. Yeah. I'll have it for next week. Um, <laughs> that, that's fine. I just, yeah, it's, it's interesting to hear what he does with this harmonically. Yeah. yeah. Um, let, me, let me go back just a little bit um, in the recording and uh, so we can kind of get into it. Here, this should, this should do it. <laughs> Thank you. 
Jeez. So, <laughs> so yeah, so quite interesting here. And I, I'm, it's always been these, um, these, these fifths, of course, I do them with the thumb uh, for the E and <laughs> <laughs> the B that's there, it's always a scary, a scary moment getting up there. It's, it always feels like you're on a tightrope a little bit. Um, definitely would love to hear you all's thoughts, but definitely uh, listening to actually what's actually happening in the piano here. Yeah. Well, I thought I would uh, <clears throat> venture to talk a little bit about uh, the transition that Walker's doing here. Um, he's doing, um, you know, I guess, uh, rhythmic diminution. Uh, it's just, you know, classic composer kind of thing to slow things down. Um, I, I, I don't know, I, I think this should be very relaxed. And I remember when I first was playing the piece and I was always trying to uh, maybe go a bit faster. Um, I, I do like, a, like a, a slower expressive thing going on with this because then the piano too can also have a little bit more of um, freedom when they come and you could hear when the piano part comes in you get the 16th notes in the left hand um, it, it provides more rubato I think if it goes faster first of all uh, I felt more stress getting all those double stops you know figuring out where where all that stuff is so um, I'm, I'm kind of taking his lead I f almost feel like there's you know beyond that the diminuendo and a writ, writ into this thing that um, it should just be very, very chill uh, when, when you arrive here. It, it, again, it's beautifully played, Emmanuel. It's, it's, it's such an, a nice singing quality that you achieve in a really unforgiving set of doubles. Yeah, Great. Yeah, maybe let's listen just one more time and then we'll keep it moving. <laughs> Just to get another idea of what's actually happening right before the cellist comes in at the Molto Minimo. So um, it's basically a series of triplets over quarter notes, essentially, in the piano part. And then from the downbeat of that, it's quarter, eighth, quarter, eighth, sorry, eighth, 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 quarter, dotted quarter, essentially, is what's happening here. So you get this feeling of two against three. So this is something that I'm finding across, regardless of what the, the the actual rhythm is the met metricity of all of it. He's still dealing with a, a lot of this same type of propulsion, whether it's in the 16 um, ideas that come later in, in, the, in the work, in the second kind of minimoso going into the alagando, especially, um, mm -hmm. you hear this the same type of theme and idea. So it, it's quite interesting to hear how the cello and the piano part kind of interact against each other. section here which is probably this new material it's like one of my favorite um themes here. <laughs> actually can i say one more thing uh before you move on is that okay about this second theme i just want to jump in the other one thing that i want to also that i thought was incredible about this is uh, uh the second theme is of course it's it, it feels very much different from the opening uh it is a, a moment of respite and, and chill uh, the, the, as um, Emmanuel was saying, those double stops are a challenge, but uh, to play lyrically and, and in tune. Uh, but I love the fact that how it relates to the opening melody as well. There's, there's some relation and it's just, again, you know, kind of a classical um, structural uh, attention that is, that is masterful and really, really, really cool to hear. That's all I want to say. You no, know, he's constantly quoting and re-quoting or kind of like a segmentation of, 
of it all. And I think that's one of the great things. It, it reminds me a lot of um, many of the, like, like the mental Sanjala Sonata, the second Sonata, in that same way you can take the same idea and then it, it sits slightly differently each time. And maybe even with the modulations that are built in there, and it, they, you should probably aim towards trying to make them um, feel a little bit different, not necessarily just a, a same kind of a um, re-expression of the same material once over again. So this same idea is just um, transposed down an octave, I think, later, uh, this same material here. Um, so let's maybe go on, unless anyone else, Manuel, anyone? I was, I could just tell you uh, straight away that I did add a lot of slurs in this thing uh, to smooth it out. And I yeah. mean, you, you <laughs> yeah. all have done the same. So I've got the, um, you know, the, the first edition of the, of the piece. So, uh, but that's just, you know, if somebody's out there trying to play this, yeah, slur in, in this. Yeah, I'm guilty of that too. Like Astrid, I, I do a lot of slurs. I think it works okay. It has to... Yeah, it can work. Yeah, I think even in the in the opening melody, especially in this three four bar, some parts of this I don't really keep all of it separate because I feel like that line that be down body daddy. So the the G F back to the G, I put the, I slur together the G F, um, and then link it back together because I felt I, I guess in the early versions of this I think it was fine, but as you get older you start. To think about what is it I'm saying or what I'm trying to say and trying to listen also and take the kind of comments from George or any of these composers uh, and bring out something that, that truly does like ascend and really just flies. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, please, please correct me if I'm if I'm overstepping with the statement, but I do find that whenever I've worked on pieces by uh, composers that are pianists, you know, the you have to really think about what the ink means, because for a pianist, two notes next to each other might with a pedal might make a slur, you know, it's, a, it's sometimes what they're trying to convey. You know, as string players, we approach the, the notation a little bit differently. So I, I think it's really interesting to hear you guys talk about about that, actually, like how to how to make things legato and maybe someone new to the piece might be staring at something that looks like a bunch of separated notes. I think it's always important to keep in mind the context of, of what the composer's medium is in most cases. It's it's really true, Francesca. I mean, he with that that opening m material, um, I remember trying various slurs for Dr. Walker, and he said, "Yes, that's the sound." And so I end up with most of the triplets in this piece being slurred, um, which makes for some very interesting. <laughs> other, <laughs> other problems technically, but um, yeah, well, I guess that that's. We, there are a lot of remedies for this issue. Yeah. Uh, well, let's press press forward into this next section. I think we're pretty much arriving upon it, and I guess recording wise, um, or we are here. Um, the, this piano part is actually one of my favorite, uh, as far as the writing. Um, I think he really put his soul in here, but not you know, Of course, the, the cello part is just so great. And I always say it just feels good in the hand, except for that double stop section. <laughs> it's a little scary. But beyond that, <laughs> it really just, it, um, you know, you just have those pieces where you can tell either they have connected with the cellist in writing the work, and it all just, it really does work, even if it does challenge you and puts, you know, pushes you. Um, it just, it's like, yes, why? This, of course, works. It, it wouldn't be anything other than that, yeah. Just a little bit here. Okay. All right. Here we go. section actually just really yeah. <laughs> and then definitely getting these the, yeah. the cello entrances off of this kind of 
sixteenths that feel like they just come out of nowhere in the piano part. Like, wait, was that my downbeat? Was that <laughs> the upbeat? Um, maybe you all could talk a little bit about this and about these sections and maybe ways to think about this outside of just saying, just count. Uh, but <laughs> if there are any things you come up with as far as just the listening um, and kind of helping kind of guide you as far as guideposts for, for this section specifically with all the sixteen. Yeah. I mean, I, oh, go ahead, Amy. Oh, sorry, Astrid. Um, uh, I was just going to say, it was just gorgeous piano playing from Joy Klein Finney. Uh, and uh, when you're a, a sonata partner, you, that's exactly what you want. Uh, I, I think that, you know, um, talking about what uh, Seth was saying, you know, uh, getting into this particular excerpt, I think you just have to listen to the... Um, um, that that piano line that di da di da di da di da dum di da and just make a composite in your mind. Um, that's that always seems to be the best way to go is find out you know what is the the most essential elements happening at that moment. Um, I did want to say that it's not written here, but when and this is why working with Joy was just such an amazing experience is that. We both were very um, simpatico about what we wanted to do with the piece. And when these uh, 16th notes at the top of the page there come back in, we take a new tempo there. It's not really written, but it, it just helps drive things forward. And then she pulls it back for her own solo that comes later. So there has to be sort of a give and take, I think, with, with tempo in this piece. It's like a lot of great pieces. There are, there are multi-personalities and... Um, uh, multi layers to to what's happening, um, and um, I, I also think that um, uh, I wrote in little cues in the part which were possibly needed. You know, uh, you know, in, in uh, where the cello comes in after those two measures of rest, I have uh, a little cue to myself where the piano goes ta ti ta di dum, so I know the composite rhythm there. Uh, which is always always useful. So I wrote in some cues. I think this piece needs them here and there for sure. Yeah, you can almost imagine that um, George Walker might have put an a tempo or a tempo primo marking um, at that spot right after the fermata on the top line. Um, he, I have some directions from him to move forward there and to kind of reinvigorate the rhythm. Um, and I think his music is so kind of essentially, um, uh, well, is he, con counterpoint is at the heart of everything. There's a lot of imitation, even if it's fragmented bits of ta-da, ta-da, you hear the piano trying to interrupt. And of course, you know, in this case, the piano wrong foots the cellist constantly, but it's that reiteration of that motive that, that really drives this and makes it kind of a little bit manic. Definitely. Um, oh, yeah, go ahead. Amy. I was just going to add exactly. There's a that feeling of of uh, of uh, uh, of an instability uh, throughout. You can never really get a foothold. Yet the important motives do come out, like that. Like Estrid was saying, but there, it's kind of like he keeps you guessing a little bit, and that. That's why it's important, yeah, like to, you know, really know what is happening when, because he does not uh, give you any, again, not uh, any solid foothold where you feel like you're going to be in a certain rhythmic feeling for over <laughs> half a bar or a bar. And that, that, that's uh, wonderful. Um, well, I want to, in light of time, I want to keep, keep it going. But do we have any questions that have come in from anyone? No, I mean, a lot of appreciation posts right oh, now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, shout out to Mike Block, who I know was watching, who I think it was his first time hearing about the piece. So <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Hi, Mike. <laughs> Mike, how you doing? Uh, Mike. <laughs> I like your well new album. He, yeah, it's great. He is well loved. <laughs> <laughs> Very much. Um, let's press forward a little bit. Um, we're kind of, we're moving in towards the Pumosa section here, uh, which is also um, another great section that I think we probably all do love.
I, 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 really, <laughs> I, I wish our YouTube viewers could have seen that dance Owen just did, but I think it was off camera. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> I didn't think you could see me. Wait a minute. I can only see one person. What are, yes, what I think they with? can only, nobody saw it but me. It's okay. okay. <laughs> this just fires me up. I got to tell you, I can't, I cannot lie. It fires me up. Anyway, and, and Manny, oh my gosh. What a beautiful uh, performance. It really is something you enjoy. Uh, home run. It's lovely. Oh, but we did a lot of work. I, I must admit, there were times there, you know, I just had to count so much. Where, just where those pizzicatos are, just just there, just like, okay, count. Um, um, and then before the high E flat, there were times in performances I'd look back and I'd, I'd he see her and she'd be going, da 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 And then I'd just go right into it because I wouldn't trust it at first. But then, then, you know, you've done it enough times and you're like, okay, I can trust this. Um, so, but it, it's, it's, it's like Seth's saying, um, some of this stuff, I mean, he lets you, he really lets things hang out forever. Like before those harmonics, if you're not counting, it won't line, line up. I mean, your pianist can fudge things for you, but uh, it does have that, that structure where you got to stay on top of it. It occurs to me that some of the, the what seems like random um, arrhythmia <laughs> is really George trying to get a kind of swoop to the drive. So that 5-8 bar where you were looking at Joy, I was looking at her too then for that okay. same thing. But, but that kind of precipitates the climax of this whole section. And so he kind of writes it in. And if you, if you do what he says, you, you kind of get the gist of the flow that he had in mind. But it... It does. It takes quite a bit of uh, preparation, and he's ratcheting up the tension uh, with with these with these rhythmic figures. It's it's incredible what what, what he creates here. Yeah, absolutely. You know, can I actually ask? A, may I ask a question? Is that all right? As as the person who hasn't played this piece here, and you know, I'm noticing. Um, you know, there's a lot of obviously mixed meters, lots of five, eight, lots of 11, eight. It doesn't sound like it. And I know that I'm just bringing up this point again for anyone who might be new, um, either to this style of music or to this piece. But again, I think sometimes notation can be de deceptive. You know, we see an 11, eight and we might go into, a, oh gosh, this has to be a one, two, one, two, three, you know, and like make it complicated. But I'm, I'm getting the impression, I mean, obviously from the recording, but also from how you guys are talking about this, that. I think lyricism really reigns, I think, in the style of the piece. I think this is another kind of moment of don't let the, the ink on the page, you know, uh, push you a certain way if the music is, is really trying to say something else. That yeah, they, that's right. To still be there. Under, with the lyricism, I think the motor underneath still, you, I think you still need to find a way to be able to internalize that, um, both as the pianist and also as the cellist. And understanding is actually what's what's going on here. I think in the first few first few performances, I think you know you're still trying to figure out what is what is this thing and how am I really going to navigate it, and counting like hell essentially. And then eventually, there are moments where I think you can relax <laughs> and know like even in this section, like maybe five five or six bars into this pumo, so really the the piano and the cello come together in this same the same rhythm, this these twos essentially. Um, right. I, I guess the point I, I was thinking of was that, um, you know, sometimes like m meters and phrases, we tend to treat them like they, they overlap and sometimes meter isn't really honest to what the phrase is doing. And I guess that's the impression I'm getting. There are things that are pickups that may look like it's an important yeah. beat of a 5-8, but, but the phrase is saying one thing. Yeah, Francesca, it's interesting that you say that because that 11-8 bar right. at the bottom line, I think, you know, personally, I came to the conclusion that George made that an 11-8 in order to put a 3-4 downbeat bump bump because then the subsequent bars are a riff on that and it becomes a transition into something new. So he kind of needed to isolate the eighth notes with the accents um, as their own little motivic entity. So by making the 11-8, he was able to do it. He might be like, no, that's way, you're way overthinking this. <laughs> but it, it gave me a way to wrap my head around it. Yeah, that's interesting. Hmm. Yeah, that's perfect. I, yeah, I, 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 I have to just say what's, so every, what everyone's saying, so what, what jumps out at me and what I know about this piece is, isn't it, isn't it incredibly brilliant and in how he can actually write 
literally write these things down with these rhythms and everything. Yet, um, uh, so you have that level, and then you have this lyrical over it, and 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 they're both. Um, uh, he knows exactly what he's doing. They're both creating a certain, um, they're both uh, feeding into themselves. So you can look at it lyrically, uh, you know, that 5-8 before the high E flat. I mean, that that's brilliant because uh, at once it's a surprise, but yet um, it takes care of all the rhythmic uh, uh, complexity behind it. So it, 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 it all serves the same purpose. Uh, and that is, I think, uh, uh, a real challenge for any composer. And that's what, in my my view, makes is one of the small things that make this such a beautiful piece and brilliant piece. No, right, to your point, you were talking about scaffolding earlier, Owen. Um, and I think like, it, it's interesting when a meter can actually really affect the feeling of a phrase. I mean, so not, it's not just a mechanical thing, right? It's not just, oh, well, I want to have five notes in this measure, but it's, it's the anticipation that that five, eight, creates because it's it, it removes that eighth note that would make this feel like it's a square beat right it makes us suddenly feel like we're holding our breath or, or skipping a moment and it's really powerful exactly and yeah. so it it, it 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 and then it, it heightens the emotional feeling of what comes next just that off balance feel uh, it's it's right, really like cool it's hard it's hard to pull off though i mean you know we we are uh, in a lot of ways, uh, uh, when something's a little bit off, you have to feel it. But, you know, one of the things about this piece uh, is certainly everything that, like what Manny was saying about, you know, having to look for the piano for what, you know, the more you play it, though, the more you feel it, you know, and and, uh, and it makes more sense, like most, most music, um, even with these technical aspects. Um, but it's it, it's also what makes it so much fun, and you're at, you kind of you can't sit down with this. You, it's really um, this movement uh, really keeps you on your toes. Seth, I know you want to move on to the next section, and I just want to say, as we're all like marveling over the brilliance of this composition, I, I have in my little cheat sheet here for my address to audiences. That, this, that George Walker w was the recipient of several um, Guggenheim Awards. He had a Fulbright. He went to study with Boulanger in Paris. He won several Rockefeller grants. Uh, he, he went to McDowell Colony in Yaddo, National Endowment of the Arts Awards. I mean, <laughs> he was so appreciated for just this kind of rigor and invention. Um, so we're surprised because we, you know, the piece fell off the map a little bit, but he was not surprised by what he was able to bring to this. And I, in his later years, he was still, you know, a, a very lovely man, but maybe had a little bit less modesty about, you know, like, yes, of course, <laughs> look at my resume. Yeah. No, definitely, definitely. Um, still always, I think, I, I always felt that he was always fiery, I guess, in some ways. and still wondering to this day why more don't know i think in our earlier conversations other cellists we we'd known or had known of the piece and maybe started the piece but never quite performed it or maybe performed only singular movement maybe the second movement that's how they knew of the work yeah. but never actually fully studied it and fully uh performed the work so it's really exciting um to commune with all of you and kind of helping usher in new generations of cellists and go tell your teachers like I heard about this piece and I want to play this piece you know um because it you know it is really truly a gem of the just of the the cello repertoire but especially of the American cello repertoire um, that needs to be played a lot more and recorded a lot more um so let's uh unless there's any other comments about this section okay <laughs> taskmaster <laughs> Okay, so let's um, go on to this next section. We're moving in towards, this becomes like transitional material that get, basically brings us back into tempo one um, with the original material again, uh, which is quite interesting. I would love to hear how everybody interprets this. Uh, we, we, of course, we're gonna hear Emmanuel's um, performance here, but definitely how you dealt with this material. I'm gonna start a little bit before, so and then kind of go right into it.
hard. We made it. <laughs> A little, little bit more expressivity there. <laughs> I was thinking yeah. the same thing. That's beautifully done, Emmanuel. Yeah. Wow. Great. So, let me give Joy a little bit of credit here. Um, this place where it goes, where the excerpt starts, da -yi, da, 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 she would always say to me, hey, what's your rush? Would you just, just open this up a little bit? And um, that, that was always a smart thing to do instead of keeping it in the... Da da ba ba da ba da ba da, you know, ba dum ba ba da ya da da da. She she was always very very um, uh, telling me that that really should be a big statement. I totally agreed with her. Um, and then what's interesting is uh, another artist urges you on to do something creative and interesting with the sonata like this. And then later when we got to ninety three, where there was that pizzicato, there's a, an octave pizzicato. I don't know if we're looking at it right now. Um, yeah, we are. Actually. It's the fourth line down, third bar, the six four. Right there, I decided, hmm, I want to kind of just stop the show there uh, because he asked for an accelerando and a crescendo. And um, Astrid, you should say some of the things that we discussed before about this area because I thought it was awesome what you said. But right there, I decided to kind of tease the audience a little bit and start out slowly and then you know, roll right into the, into the, uh, into the, uh, uh, the recap, um, you know, statement of the first theme again. Um, so it, that, that sort of nice stuff that happened, you know, creativity uh, sort of happened, joy pushing me to do certain things and then me coming up with something else interesting. Um, I, I, I never got any bad comments from Dr. Walker on that spot. So, and I was lucky. I think I I didn't really listen to the pre uh, the recording that he made, which was interesting um, because I I guess I didn't know it existed. I knew about Owen though, <laughs> so but I didn't know about the earlier recording because I know some of these things are not in some of the earlier recordings. So it was it just sort of happened organically. Um, but it's, it's, it's beautiful the way he does it. Astrid, could you speak about what you said about this, this section here? Uh-oh, what I did I? I awesome. <laughs> well, I, it's funny that you should say, Emmanuel, that you were teasing us with the recap, the return to this main melody, because that was exactly what I thought when I heard you play it. I was like, oh, that's great. He's, he's toying with us. Um, and you really give yourself a little bit of a kind of cadenza-like freedom. Um, which I think is so lovely. And so we get to hear, you know, these little motives, these fragments reassemble themselves into something more motoric. And boom, before we know it, not only is the motor alive again and humming, but the theme is, is taking you up and away. And it, it's just right. wonderfully done. I think also you said that it's, it's when motive becomes motion and turns into melody. Yeah, well, I think I think he does that from the beginning, doesn't he? He kind of constructs this so that that can happen, and it, and he does it so effectively. Just so on target, exactly what you're saying. Um, that's that's the the beauty in it. Well, that's that's great. Yeah, he he knew what he was doing, <laughs> and you you brought it to light. Yeah, it's it's it was there ripe for taking. I think it's not me. It's you know, it's just discovering what's actually there. You know, it's already implicit in a way. Okay, well maybe we can jump <laughs> <laughs> forward um, to our next section, which is kind of bring us up, up around. It's more of a, it's additional material, but that incorporates the, the romantic, romanticized material, mostly from the piano part that's kind of pulling from the second movement and looking at more of the 16th material and the treatment of the 16th material specifically looking at these twos and three ties so that ties ties of three sixteenths and the open two so that especially in the piano part which we've heard a little quite a bit of already but kind of paying a little bit more attention to that that then kind of leads us in towards um this ending especially in this last line you see in this excerpt here with the, the with the cello and the last pumosa body body diddy so this, it's almost like this insistent uh nature that's all, that's happening that's been he's been walker has been pushing literally almost the entire time, especially from the second second theme onwards. And then how the cello basically breaks out of that into this kind of extremely rhapsodic alargando that really is 
makes me feel like I'm it's, it's shlomo off for just like yeah. a slight second. <laughs> um, so let's, let's listen to a little bit unless someone has something to say ahead of time. No, but someone's going to need to explain to me how you do those pizzicatos on the F in the same class line. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a, I use the, I hold down with the fourth, essentially, or, oh, I, it's two, and then I use, I think I use the fourth finger. It was some like hard, hard left hand <laughs> pits. <laughs> um, yeah, I, definitely a, a balancing act. I think something along those, but <laughs> others have, want to give away their fingering, their fingering tricks here. <laughs> Trade secret, maybe I don't know. <laughs> I, I I held on to the uh, the G G flat and the F were on the G string with fourth finger, and I reached back for the F with my uh, maybe my thumb or first finger, and then used whatever was left over. <laughs> I was definitely multitasking. Yeah, I I definitely put the uh, I put my thumb on that F, and then yeah, whatever finger you have to. Uh, probably your second finger or thir uh, first finger to pluck it, but that's why I, I have that in here. Same. Uh, whatever you can, you you can also yeah. use your teeth. You can use your teeth. I was going to say, I thought, I assume somebody might have gone gone with chin answer D, but <laughs> <laughs> that's not this piece. Not this piece. <laughs> or, or your nose. You can okay. use your nose. I think you can also for that figure that the G flat G flat F. I think it's. I've done four, two, one on the F, the upper F, and then I just use three. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a balancing act to basically make sure you still have a, a solid upper F that holds yeah. you through and allows you to still be able to get those pizzas to speak more, very much so like a hammering technique, yeah. So for the audience, there there is a way. And yeah. maybe now yeah. that's gonna play the recording. We <laughs> promise. And thumbs, third fingers, <laughs> whatever you'd like. <laughs> It'd be a big hand and an extension of two. Um, <laughs> let, let's listen to some of this. You're going to go a little bit before and then get into it. Tricky, huh? <laughs> Just it's it's quite hard and to be able to get uh, that. I don't remember a comment from from Walker talking about really talking about these pieces, which is I guess it's been so long now. Like how how present they should be, you know, as far as, far as the texture, what's going on also underneath it. But maybe to be honest, the, the effect almost sounds like I don't know what you call the technique, but when the pianist put their puts their hand inside the piano and then thumps the strings, that's that's kind of what it sounds like to me. That's right. That's a great analogy. It kind of, when you hear the third movement too, when we get there next week, th this this will seem like a little bit of a uh, fore foreboding or a, a foreshadowing of what's to come. Mm -hmm. it's incredible. I think, um, it's, it's kind of like a little, it's it's like a, a, all those things in a little backbeat. It's just a backbeat, very, very cool. Kind of very jazzy feel, you know, on the back of the beat. I love that. Yeah. Emmanuel, did you? Yeah, I, I think I, I, I would say that uh, my strategy, at least as a cellist, and I know we're, got, we're speaking to cellists out there too, as well as you know, music lovers in general, chamber music lovers. Um, my strategy was to get to the C string as soon as possible, like, uh, right, like right before the measure uh, where the pizzicato happens. I'm already on the C string by that B natural. Mm. 
Wow. And I get right into thumb position because you don't want to be messing around. Uh, so you can get right into thumb position, right, right, uh, or just about to get into it there. And then the pizzicatos, I love what Francesca said about the quality. I think what you have to do is you have to play them no matter what the dynamic is. You're going you're gonna to play them for titissimo and they're going to come out whatever they're going to be. Hmm. That should be enough. <laughs> yeah, that's Hopeful. wonderful. Okay, well, maybe let's press on into this next section. Before we go on, can I ask one really kind of nerdy question? Um, Emmanuel, I, you know, in the beginning of this excerpt, a body, da -de -de -da -de, and then yep. uh, before it gets the, the forte. Yes. I have here, you, do, I played those harmonics um, and, and up high. Did Joy ever, uh, you, you, and you, and you, and, and it's great. It's good. This is like, I'll tell you, this is so nerdy, but I'm just wondering, yeah. did, did Dr. Walker, did, did anybody have a, um, uh, opinion on where that, where, what octave that's played the three, four, you know, the one with the fermata. Right. Yeah. Right there. It's just D and G as far as I know. Yeah. And okay. in his recording, he, the cellist does it differently, right? Yeah. Oh, he comes oh, up oh, an oh, octave. Right. Yeah. 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 Babini, I, I, uh, guys? What's that? Are, are you guys talking about the Babini recording? Is it different? Yeah. I, I don't know what, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I didn't hear that there, but I remember I, maybe that's where I got it from. Um, I usually go up, uh, you know, up high, but I just wondered if that, uh, same notes, the one octave, uh, same notes, one octave higher on I... uh, at least one octave higher. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, dee -da, dee -da, ha. Yeah, I heard that too in the recording. I I never did it that way though. I did the Emmanuel version. Yeah, no, yeah. No. I just that well, that's my nerdy question. It's like, uh, is there a was there a definitive? Because I want to play it right. Uh, is there a definitive version of that? Uh, either way, it sounds great. So maybe anyway, let's all we can move on. Way. I'm gonna. <laughs> I I I have some notes um, from Doctor Walker after that performance and also after we made made the recording i'm gonna go back and dig through so i'll have some sort of answer maybe i'll say i don't didn't find the answer but i'll tell something next time when we meet uh, six okay not not incredibly important but i just was wondering yeah, uh, yeah that'd be cool whatever yeah no and obviously in the interest of time i mean i think if we're all comfortable i and our audience as well i think it would be great if um Next week, we'll save the second movement, do the second and third movement. So I don't know if we want to wrap up first movement today or possibly play the opening as a teaser. I'll leave that up to you, Seth, how you want to. Uh, well, we ha well, let's see. Um, we only have just this little bit left, my favorite part. Um, would you guys like to close out the first movement or would you like to start in do, on the second? Do it, Seth, do the part, like do yeah. this, you can do it. Okay, all right. So let's just hear the very ending of, of this, um, of the first movement, which is, it's quite exciting that going from the Alagando and then back this kind of propulsion that happens, but then the kind of uh, a desegmentation or breakdown essentially of the rhythm over, over this twos against these threes, essentially that's happening, um, starting from the Alagando. So let's get into this. All right, here we go. gorgeous oh, yeah wonderful wonderful playing it's just great writing it's just gorgeous <laughs> so what are thoughts in in this alagando section obviously you still hear this buddy -de -de, this this same uh 16th material that's still under under the whole thing and obviously Seth, isn't it hard on to 
Seth, isn't it like like what we were hearing before, before that high E flat? The piano does that. Da 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 ba. It's that same motif he's just bringing back in a. He's giving it to the cello finally. Yes, finally. Uh, so I mean, it's it's got its. It, it, again, it's all these ideas in a great composer always like pregnant. They 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 have their they you know they spawn other other versions of themselves and i think the material he has here is just so fertile that he can just he can just keep taking it and putting it in different places it's it's amazing it's really true and the the way he augments things is just such a, a great way to wind down naturally um and he sets the stage beautifully for the next movement which kind of picks up right in the same vein definitely um other other thoughts are there questions out there, Francesca? There are a couple comments I can share. Um, I know that when we were back when we were talking about um, the the meters, um, Ismar had another comment. He said there are a lot of odd meters. I just think the note groupings seem off sometimes. Perhaps they could have been clearer. Uh, the instruments are sometimes playing rhythmic figures of different lengths, which leads to a lot of confusion at first. Um, so that was one comment. I'll just share the other comment briefly from um, Will Schultz, who says, uh, George was never a show-off and maybe a bit too modest. He had a fantastic technique, and that was very apparent when we performed Tchaikovsky Trio and the Britain. He and Anne Epperson have always been my favorite collaborators. Yeah. That's great. You know, pianist. yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, one thought about the, um, the meters again, just to sort of go back to why it, it might have been his choice not to make things clearer, tidy up the packaging rhythmically. Um, I think there's a certain amount of um, mystery and delight in the ambiguity and, you know, allowing for things to kind of seem a little unsettling. That's, that's one of the driving forces of the, of the movement, right? Is that you, you feel, I don't know, I, I hear a little 20th century angst in that kind of writing. Um, and then how things kind of, not, not quite in a Carter-like way, but you do have these metric modulations of a kind and you find yourself in new territory. So I, I always tried to kind of take it with that, um, in that spirit, because otherwise you, you do start asking yourself, like, couldn't you have made this simpler? And I think, <laughs> I think that was part of the idea. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that the, 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 um, uh, he, he wasn't trying to make it simple and, 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 and doing that, it adds just what Esther just said, it adds to the sort of underlying restlessness that occurs almost to the very end. It's only at the very end that he is able to sort of calm down, you know, but it's always that da 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 da, -da you know, and uh, just the way it's written uh, physically, I think adds to that sort of emotional feeling. So there's basically innate ten uh, tension that's built in through through just the metric design of, of the work, especially in the piano, but definitely as it trades um, into the into the cello. And there's moments even where this material comes in even earlier um, through this quite kind of romantic section. And then so all of this stuff here, you're getting it already in, in, even in these moments. So the pianist and the cello are really trading back and forth, even though it many times it I guess if one is listening maybe for the first time, it really feels like a lot of that material is um, kept in the piano to help be really the train for this, but they really are very much so working together. Um, and it's quite special, this kind of exposed uh, last three bars here for the for the cello. And then you just in the last, I guess what two, the last beat of the eight eight um, of the first measure of that, the pianist finally comes in with the chords and then it just kind of dis dissipates only to kind of restart in a much more somber uh, mode for the second uh, second movement, yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe here is a good uh, place for us to uh, take a pause until next week. Um, but I want to thank everybody for being here, for bringing all your thoughts and experiences and all the comments out in uh, the ether. Um, and please do join us next week, same time, same place. Um, and um, thank you all. You have thank, any comments. thank you so much, Seth, for organizing us and um, Manuel for your beautiful recording. It's great being with you guys. Yeah, great. Thanks, Seth. Thanks, Astrid. 
<laughs> yeah, sec second and third. If you if you think the first moment's great, second and third <laughs> moment is really really second moment so beautiful. It third is moment, so just cool. Uh, Stay tuned. Work. Stay yeah, tuned. <laughs> Well, I guess that's all. So thank you all again, and we'll see you next week. Oh, thank for, you guys. The split, huh? Hey, I'm ready. She had, to, she had to go. Oh, right. I forgot. Well, right. that's right. Okay. She had something. Yeah. I was like, where is she? Yeah. yeah. All right. It's a pleasure being with you guys. See you next week. Yeah. See you next week. Yeah. Same time. Bye-bye. Wonderful. <laughs>